Uh, okay, look, well, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, the Diego and Dez show is on again. Um, and this time, as Ned said, we thought we might tackle the con sort of the conditions in practice, but it started with a conversation between Diego and I about the way architects treat architects uh, and whether that has any bearing on the current issue. We then started to consider it historically uh, and we realised very quickly just chatting that there's some pretty famous examples of architects doing good things for one another and then architects doing not very good things for one another. Um, so we thought we might start that and open up a conversation about, because we do end with it, it's sort of the nature of practice in the profession now, as well as because we both teach, and I think we'd agree with this, um, the nature of the discipline of architecture and the practice of architecture and the distinction between academia and practice, I'm going to suggest is probably more pointed than it's ever been, certainly, uh, certainly in my experience. Um, and we think that's a little problematic. So at the end, we'll round that up. But on the way through, we we're going to make, make some commentary about some of the correspondences between architects. And I think it also rebounds on the, the nature of the practices and also often the quality of the work. <coughs> I think we're interested in it being <coughs> conversational. So if you, haven't, if you want to chip in, then please do. We have um, gathered these ideas and thoughts and we're... As always, we're just interested to talk about them. So we thought we'd start with the uh, one of the most famous disputes, uh, which is between Benini and Borromini, uh, and Borromini, as long also with Carlo Ronaldo, I think, did Sant'Agnese in Piazza Navona, and the great combatants in, in, almost in Rome. In Rome, just, yeah, just sorry, just yeah, 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 not in Geelong. Uh, <laughs> Borromini and Benini did not get on. Um, I, for me, Benini, Borromini is the serious architect. Benini is a fabulous architect, but also a sculptor, a bit of a man about town. He did, he did the fountain, and the argument always was that the Four Rivers Fountain had his sculptures, his sculptures cringing and cowering in front of the um, Borromini facade, thinking, how the hell did we end up here? Uh, why, do we have to, the guys yeah. uh, like, why do we have to put that. up with this? Yeah. Uh, which is a bit silly, really, because they're both incredible architects. Uh, but it did set in train some of this discussion and conversation for us about how architects treat architects. The thing is, it seems that the story, um, well, it's a very kind of a nearly mythical story that we've always told <coughs> these architects. And, some years ago, a, some researchers actually looked into that uh, with a bit of detail, and actually, it's impossible that it was because the uh, the uh, church by Borromini was finished uh, something like six years later. And one of the founders. So either Bonini was very intuitive, uh, knew that it was going to be rubbish, or actually, the story is something that uh, the profession has made up, so, which actually doesn't matter really. But uh, pretty good. There's some other st uh, stories about the dispute between these two guys, uh, quite strong. There was another building that they did. The Borromini got the commission for a, a, a palace, a palace of something. The Barberini. Yeah, the Barberini thing. And it was right next to where, um, where Benini used to live. Huh? His house was there. So in the corner of the facade, where it was facing uh, Benini's house, I think... Uh, uh, Benini, uh, Borromini sculpted uh, kind of a rabbit, uh, no, a donkey here yeah, with the ears like this, kind of looking at, looking at the other house. <laughs> in response, Bernini, uh, in the corner uh, right next to it, uh, apparently he sculpted a phallus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they were both removed kind of something like 50 years later uh, because they were considered indecent uh, by the room. So, so it must have been kind of a pretty <coughs> big thing to speak between these two guys. Uh, uh, yes. I would say at this point, though, there's also great recognition from one to the other about their stature as well. So that's also why it's quite famous. And as we move through this, we're going to suggest that some of that has diminished quite dramatically, and we don't think that's a good idea. Um, this one I put in very late. Uh, and I put it in as much for anecdotal evidence. Uh, we put the Palladian crosshairs in. Thank you, Thero. Um, not to cross him out, this is Palladio. 
Uh, and I read recently that, um, and this is architects thinking about other architects and joining themselves to other architects. Uh, Palladio was into numerology and uh, other kind of mathematical pursuits. And there is a story that in some system, if you do Andrea Palladio using the numbers associated with each of the letters, you get Vitruvius to come out the other end of it, which is quite a cool anecdote. Because and Andrea Palladio is not his real name, so he changed his name to Andrea Palladio. And the suggestion is that he gets that by doing numbers on Vitruvius, um, which is kind of interesting that someone would attach themselves to a, what for the early Baroque was probably the greatest architect of historical times that they knew anything about. So. <clears throat> We didn't put Rem Coolhouse in there. Um. Well, I did. I did. <laughs> Des disagrees. I agree. I agree. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yes. Okay. The architects disagreeing there. All right. Well, these the three masters are in there uh, because of the anecdotes, both for and against them. Um, not Coolhouse. Coolhouse would probably side with Cord more than the others, I imagine. Okay. Well, he's called a new call. Right? Is he? Yeah. That's what his mum calls him. But, uh, <laughs> <coughs> might be, might be. Okay. So uh, we put these couple in. Um, this is Mies, Mies van der Rohe. Uh, is there a mouse? Yeah. Mies van der Rohe here. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright there. And Frank Lloyd Wright and Mies there. This is at Teleessen. And this is on the site at the Johnson Wax building. And uh, Ro Mies had huge respect for Wright. Wright is a whole generation older than him. And Wright actually had some respect for Mies when Mies went to the States, escaping, basically escaping Nazi Germany um, in 38. Uh, he did pay a couple of visits to Wright, as recorded here, but they did have some correspondence. Uh, and although their architecture is quite different, they had huge respect for one another. And, I think Wright probably had uncommonly high respect for Mies, given that Frank Lloyd Wright didn't have a lot of respect for anyone. a lot of architects. Um, probably anyone. <coughs> probably anyone. Okay. Uh, <coughs> but I think we're also interested in, at least putting back in your mind, the scale of the kind of characters who did have correspondence. Uh, because we can't find a photo of Corb and Wright, because we don't think they ever met, but there is another urban myth about Corb apparently showing up at Taliesin uh, and someone informing Wright that Luca Busio is at the gate, and Wright's response was, tell him that we only have architects on the property. Uh, <laughs> so whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but certainly Wright uh, did not have any time for Luca Busio at all. Um, but I certainly enjoy this photograph of Corb and Mies talking at the site of the Weisenhof Seidelung, for which Mies was the main architect, and did the collective housing unit. And there's an amazing repertoire of international architects, basically all European, really, probably. Um, yeah. European architects doing, I think, about 20 houses in this exposition of which Corb did too, um, JJ Piud, Sharon, everybody you care to name, uh, probably did one there. And these two guys are talking on site at that point. Um, and Diego and I were just, of course, wondering what they might be talking about. Um, <clears throat> but we can't do that for Wright and Corb, which is problematic from the outside in a way that the t two of the great masters uh, had very little time. Well, it seems one of them certainly had no time for the other. <clears throat> we just put these ones in because we like to, in this talk anyway, just mention that uh, even at the high level, often these characters did teach and talk. Uh, and this is a, the large photo is me back at um, the Crown Hall at IIT in the 60s. Uh, he's not teaching there anymore, but he's come back to talk to the students, um, lucky enough to sit in one of his own chairs. Uh, and th these characters were incredibly influential and 
you can tell by the people sitting around that they're pretty engaged by just the fact that he was around. Uh, the other photo is just to show, I know it's a, you know, faked up, well it's not faked up, but you know, it's one of those take a portrait of me drawing images. Um, but this is also how me saw himself as incredibly well attired uh, and did often huge drawings with bits of charcoal. He could really draw. So is I think charcoal or cigar. So I've always wondered. I don't know. Maybe he's drawing with his cigar. But, okay. <laughs> you just don't want to mix them up if you like one, I suppose. So um, yeah, I think we're all also saying, and I'm interested in what Diego has to say, but we're also so trying to give some sense about the engagement at this level that these characters had with the profession, um, particularly their, well, I would suggest their leadership properties. And it's quite different to now the critical openness that they had to both the profession and conversations about the nature of architecture. Yes, Corb was probably the first of the super publicists. You know, there were other eight volumes of the Oeuvre Complete, which came out periodically, uh, showing all the work that had been done since the last one. Um, so he was brilliant at it. But I think you'd have to suggest that unlike current monographs, these were really offerings to the nature of architecture and not, and not about, you know, how good are we, look how many projects we've got. Because in fact, he didn't do that many projects. But the exposition of the quality of the work, what went into it, even publishing projects that didn't go anywhere, uh, and then discussing what they had to offer, is very, very different to the current monographed, super home world of current publication in architecture. Yes, if you add up the eight volumes, you know, it's about that fat, um, but it is pretty high quality stuff. And even today, certainly in the office, we still use it. Paul Katsieras has the full eight volumes. I'm sure Diego's father had the, had the eight volumes. Um, and that difference in character in the way that they work, their contribution to the profession, etc., is quite different to now. Um, and I'm certainly reflecting on it, and this is what Diego and I started to speak about. you want to say anything about this? No, I just got a little story about those eight volumes. Uh, Theo and I have got a friend back in Spain, uh, a sculpture and architect, <coughs> and he did his whole degree tracing each one of the projects in that uh, uh, in those eight volumes. I started for page one, Luis Miguel. You know? he, did, he did the structures for us in the office, uh, so he completely came crazy after that, but he was so engaged with the work by Paul that he said, oh, no, I'm not going to attend any lectures, I'm just going to trace his projects, one after the other, the plan, section, the next project, next project. So when we got to six year, when we had six years then, uh, he told me halfway through the trimester, uh, yeah, I'm done, I'm done, I think I'm an architect now because I've finished the eight volumes. <laughs> so he didn't do a project ever in his life and he started doing structures for us. <laughs> <laughs> that was the conclusion anyway. Were the drawings good that very, he did? Very good, very good. And he's yeah. a good painter. He's a good sculptor. And he's very good at... Uh, he's very good to have him in the office. I, <laughs> I love those stories. Uh, then we also kicked around the idea or some thoughts about... And Diego certainly opened this up in Masterclass last week. Uh, the nature of practice, the dedication of architects and to practice, but also thoughts about architects for whom practice was something they did and how it rubbed up against politics. I just mentioned earlier that Mies, as did most intellectuals, uh, certainly the creative intellectuals and the physicists, or the scientists anyway, left Nazi Germany. Mies left in 38 after um, quite fabulously closing the Bauhaus in Berlin. Um, because the Nazis wanted to basically tell him how to do it. Um, well, I tell him the anecdote about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, if you don't know the anecdote, well, it's not an anecdote. The story of the Bauhaus being closed in Berlin. It had already been closed in the first place in Weimar. The Nazis closed it. Then Gropius moved it to Dessau, where they had the best offer. Uh, then it was closed in Dessau um, again by the Nazis and. They moved to Berlin, where they thought they might have a little bit more scope. Uh, Mies was 
the head of the school of the Bauhaus in Berlin. And in about 37, the Nazis then stepped in and said, it will be done like this, blah, blah, blah. Mies had been resisting for a long time. Um, uh, and then apparently one day after being told this, he told the secretary to go down the shop, buy a certain number of crates of the finest champagne and enough stemware for all of the students and staff at the school. They bought all this gear back to the school. They opened the champagne, poured everybody a glass of champagne while the Nazis were outside. Uh, and he said, I toast to the school and I announce it closed. Uh, and they closed the Bauhaus in Berlin and that was the end of any of the European Bauhaus schools. Um, and about a year after that, he left Germany and went to the States where you saw him talking to Frank Lloyd Wright. So it took me a little while to live down even that association with the Nazis. Uh, but this character... Um, you know who this is? Anybody? This house? Anybody knows this house? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So Han Sharun, I think it's the Bainch house. I'm not sure if I got that correct. Yeah. Uh, I think from 35. So the Nazis have been in power for two years. Um, Han Sharun's not that old at this point. I think he's sub 40. Um, he does this house and then the Nazis basically say... Uh, modernism doesn't have any spot in German culture you know, under the Reich, which is why nearly everybody left. Um, interestingly, Sharun stayed. Sharun, Sharun basically said, uh, I'm an architect wherever I am. I'm an architect. Um, I will not leave Germany because I'm also German and I'm, I'm part of this gig, but I'm not with the Nazis. So he did not join the Nazi party. Um, he managed to get work from people who were also, I guess, politically and intellectually free enough to find their way around the restrictions of the Nazis. And let's be honest, um, to not obey was n not just pro professionally difficult. It could probably cost you your life, but certainly without much trouble. Uh, so anyway, Sharon stayed and he started doing houses which would just slide under the guard of the regime in terms of you know vernacularising German architecture, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he stayed and stayed. And at the end of the war, um, Sharon was the only one who'd actually persevered of any stature. I think Hugo Herring also persevered, but he didn't practice much after the war. But uh, Han Sharon did, and Han Sharon is the guy in the middle here. Uh, when the Allies then realized they had to rebuild Berlin, they collectively, the architects associated with it said, well, there's really only one German architect who should get this gig in the front place. And that was um, Hans Sharon, who had persevered through all the Nazi years, had lived through the war, uh, and then came out the other end of it with his intellectual stature intact. Certainly his credentials as an architect, not a political animal, completely intact. Uh, and then proceeded to be a major team leader of the efforts to rebuild Berlin. And out of that came, of course, the completely ground-changing Berlin Philharmonic Hall. And he's seen here with, where's Ned's mouse gone, Herbert von Karajan, who some of you may know him as probably the most powerful conductor of the 20th century, of um, the Berlin Philharmonic. He was a little bit associated with the Nazis, so it took him a while to live that one down. But here he is with Sharon. Sharon was not. There's a sketch of the Berlin Philharmonic Hall. And Diego and I certainly love these images of that's Is that Han Sharon? Yeah, that's Han Sharon. That's Han Sharon in uh, a fairly big model of the um, Berlin Philharmonic Hall. And then the, the most amazing thing under construction beside it. So. I guess we're, we're putting him in because of that thought about an architect who just said, I'm an architect, but also said, well, I'm also German and I'm part of this German thing, no matter what it is. Uh, but I'm not going to kowtow to the political pressures and they must have been completely enormous. Uh, but at the other end of it, he still remains an architect and I think it's great that so many other architects then not simply because of his skill, but also that's part of it. Um, his capacity to be a complete professional at that level is pretty unusual. In fact, 
I think he's probably the only one um, that I certainly know about. I think um, Spain under the dictatorship probably had similar characters. Yeah, quite. But the scale of the pressure in Germany must have been enormous. That was very different. It was very different. Actually. Yeah. Not, not <coughs> Anything else you want to say about this? No, I hope to see some moles this week. Yeah. Yeah. Next yeah. week. Yeah. Next week. Yeah. Well, Kevin's having some moles in July, so. Yeah. And again, just, you know, if, I guess what I'm also suggesting to you is that that at this level, you know, Shirun is an architect. So he, he his, even though he has to do work in a style that he has very little time for, but he's always experimenting, always testing. When he comes out the other end of it, he basically redresses the whole idea of concert halls and theatres and was really probably the most groundbreaking theatre and concert hall designer architect in the world. Uh, and certainly the Berlin Philharmonic, Philharmonic is still a masterpiece of um, theatre design. Well, it's, it still is. It's still the model. We've said it in a few lectures here. It's still the model. I mean, everybody uh, copies that material right now. Nobody in the world actually thinks of doing a concert hall, which is different from the <coughs> principles that this guy set in Berlin, which were, by the way, completely different to anything done before. Huh? So he's the guy that says, okay, this is about acoustics, a uh, way of dealing with acoustics, how, what you had to do with the roof, with the, fan, with the public, the way you place the orchestra, uh, and well, everyone. I mean, set sort of Sydney, but uh, the Disney uh, recent concert hall that uh, Gary has done in, uh, in Los Angeles, you look at the concert uh, thing, and it's identical to this. Huh? Well, not as good, well, it's trying to get it, but the principles are the same ones. Huh? And the social agenda of that as well. Yeah. How that breaks the yeah the class yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way the foyers work and all of that stuff. Yeah. Well, that's in sitting, but but then the other <coughs> one was the and that's something that the Kulhas has used quite a few times. I mean, he's the, the other one that you know you, you know this building. This the 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 concert hall is kind of hanging on top of the foyer. So or uh, so all the stairs come up from different different levels uh, and. Uh, so there is a spectacle in the public getting in and out of the of the hall itself that in many buildings has been considered even more attractive and more relevant for the project than the interior itself. Huh? So the first foyer that actually became kind of the key element uh, of a, of a uh, concert hall was, was this one. Now this, this project is <coughs> incredibly amazing. And he did quite similar kind of rethink of a program with the library which is yeah. across the road no? uh, uh, across the road of this building uh, with very similar materials does a library and he also kind of is able in the same years to rethink the program of the library that one has changed recently again uh, so the libraries are not anymore what they <coughs> were those days but certainly from the previous model of the library which was kind of a kind of a basically kind of a it was an archive of knowledge. The first one that opens uh, that up is Sharon in, in Berlin, across the road from this one, and across the road from this <coughs> and his temple, his classic temple, the National Gallery. And then there's Paris. Uh, and now we move into a couple of competitions where we think this nature of architects supporting architecture and architects becomes significant. This is obviously the start of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, which of course is done by an engineer, but um, the project that is... Okay. Oh yeah, oh, you wanted to go for okay. Yeah? The project that follows in the footsteps of that and with, came under similar criticism, if any of you know the criticism that Gustave Eiffel and the Eiffel Tower suffered in Paris. Uh, lawsuits, people just being incredulous that such a thing could happen to their beautiful city. Um, when the Pompidou Centre was announced as the winner in the late 60s, uh, with actually a team of very young architects, uh, the same thing occurred again. Um, and I just recently bought a book, it's a fantastic book by Delco about the Pompidou Centre, and I was amazed to learn that uh, this project was seven years from award to opening, uh, and in that time they suffered seven, seven lawsuits against the project while it was uh, being documented or designed, documented, and then constructed. 
uh, and a number of them were from other architects <laughs> suing them for what they were going to do to Paris and how on earth it ever was allowed to occur. Uh, and when I say lawsuits, I just don't mean you know someone ringing up the solicitor and sending them a letter. No, it was serious, appear in court, this is not going to happen, legalities will stop you, you're not allowed to do this. Uh, the fact that they were backed by Georges Pompidou, who was then the president, because this is one of the, grand, one of the first of the grand projets, um, certainly helped, but you have to give huge credit to Piano and Rogers for having the kind of gumption to stick it out through that and do such a radical, radical building um, with that. So that, of course, they received huge support from many architects, but they were also under enormous pressure from many architects. Um, of course, I'm completely glad that the judging panel and the subsequent culture persevered, and we have the Pompidou Centre now. I think it's one of the great buildings in the world, let alone in Paris. <clears throat> but I should say, uh, the, judging, the judges are also quite, quite important in this one, and this is not the only time it happens. But certainly, similarly, this is where the judges also have to side with a building which is not of their making, and not of even their style, if you like. But thankfully for us, Jean Prouvé, who was also attacked for being the head judge and not being an architect. I think his training was actually as an engineer, although many more architects would know him as an architect than engineers would know him as an engineer. He was the head judge. Uh, and Philip Johnson was one of the other judges who also argued very forcefully and convincingly for particularly um, what we call the Pompidou Centre Scheme by Piano and Rogers as the winner. And they also had to fight incredibly hard. Again, they were backed up by Georges Pompidou, basically saying, well, I'm the president and it's happening, whatever whatever comes, because that's how the process works. Um. <coughs> These are the original drawings. Imagine what they must have... I mean, I don't know how many of you have been to Paris before the Pompidou. I mean, it must have been a shock to receive this. Eh? Uh, and uh, I, I actually didn't know that Philip Johnson was part of the panel. I was quite surprised. Because he wasn't a brave man, or whatever you say, in general, in his attitude. But in this one, actually, and in the context of this presentation of architects speaking about architecture yeah. and speaking on the, of, of uh, their convictions, uh, being completely far away, and I, I would say even uh, uh, beyond the understanding of, of uh, what Philip Johnson might have got yeah. from this, uh, I think might be trusting Prouvé or something, or knowing that the professional kind of. Uh, uh, assessment that Prouvé had done was strong enough, uh, actually made this happen. Uh, and now it's a reference for all those guys that sued uh, probably him, uh, and uh, they're probably trying to do the same, and probably not magic. Yeah. You know? I, just I just love the... Because we all know the the final image of the, of the Pompidou, how it looks like right now, and I just look, like looking at these drawings from the competition, which are... And you get this... You get the flavour of the building, but it's, it's slightly different, so mm -hmm. how... How the particularly the elevation you saw before, how yeah. the principles are there, so the communication goes to the outside, so structure is a grid. I think the the idea of having all the services on the back uh, facade that's uh, something that came later probably. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They, uh, but um, yeah, it must have been a shock. I mean, for the guys on the panel, I can't imagine. Mm. Well, also it was uh, it was the only scheme that gave half of the site which is also the bravery of the judges. It was the only scheme that gave half of the site back to Paris, which is why, as you can see from the image, it's twice the height of the surrounding buildings because there was a height limit in Paris, which is quite famous. And this was the only scheme that managed to do that because it was twice as high. Uh, and its floor to floors are huge anyway. So it was very, very brave of the judges to pick out such a remarkably distinct scheme uh, when it pushed so many rules that obviously in Paris were going to be quite precious. So again, I take my hat off to Pompidou for backing it, uh, but then also for the two judges, particularly those two judges who fought incredibly hard to make sure that it went through. Um, and as we're saying, you know, this, this architect supporting architects is incredibly important, particularly when they have to argue that, argue the case later. And then of course, you know, Ten years earlier, in, in Australia, we'd had 
uh, you know, the most famous debacle of all of those events of competitions, where the Howard Rourke looking um, Jorn Knudsen was elected as the winner for the Sydney Opera House competition by, again, a very, very brave main judge, uh, Eero Saarinen, um, who I think is one of the great architects of the 20th century and actually has a huge amount to contribute in terms of the nature of practice. Um, but Utzen basically, well, Utzen's scheme was elected by the strength of Eero Saarinen. Uh, I always thought the Opera House came before Saarinen's work changed, but I read over the weekend in doing some homework for this thing uh, that in fact um, Saarinen's office had started already sketching and had a scheme for the JF Kennedy TWA terminal. The wings of the eagle became more opera house-like after the competition, but they had done, uh, not the Ingalls hockey rink, but one of the other very plastic concrete schemes before that. So he was already in that mode, but it was certainly Saarinen who elected Utzen as the winner. It was a very young Jorn Utzen, of course, anonymous competition. Uh, I tried to find them on the weekend, but I couldn't. I, When I was in Sydney a few years ago, there happened to be an Opera House exhibition on, and they happened to have the two sheets of, my memory says, about A1 um, grey card that Saarinen had done his impression of the Opera House finished to show the premiere what it would actually look like. Because if you've ever seen Woodson's competition drawings for the Opera House, they're incredibly scant. And there's a couple of lines like this on a sheet of paper, very, very evocative, but not really a worked out scheme. There's always been discussions about whether they actually had it finished or just put it in the mail and just send it off <laughs> wishing. Uh, but somewhere in that, Saarinen, and we always hear this, Saarinen was really the person who said, that's the winner. And then I saw these two drawings, which I didn't understand existed, but I read about them again, uh, where Saarinen had drawn it. And his drawing is much more like the finished scheme than the Utzon competition drawings are. The shells are much more vertical. He's got one beautiful elevational shot of it. And then there's another shot of it from the harbour on Benelong Point, and it looks like now. Whereas if you don't know, Benelong Point, before the Opera House, was the Tramways Workshop Service Yard, which is a gorgeous use for such a terrible site in a major city. Uh, but somehow, Saarinen managed to make the Opera House look like it does now in these sketches. And of course, showed them to the Premier, and the Premier then conceded and said, okay, that's the winner. We all, well, I hope many of you know what happened after that, um, where the change in government. Utzon does get enormously supported by many architects, but not all. Uh, and then, very shamefully for us Aussies, uh, we basically don't pay his bills properly, and he just says, fuck this, I'm out of here. And we still owe him 160 grand at last count, so... Um, I don't blame him for not coming back. Um, but it is shameful that that happened. But it, it is remarkable that, again, our architects on architects thing, uh, Utzon, well, it's actually architects with architects here, Saren and supporting Utzon for this incredible exercise. Amazing thing by a very young architect. I think Utzon was only in his uh, mid to late 30s when he won the competition. Mm -hmm. So 39 wasn't that okay. <coughs> And well, Diego and I just love the photos of the thing being built, which is also an example of how much effort went into actually making the thing. Uh, so the amount of commitment is astonishing. Uh, just in terms of scale, I think it's also worth mentioning that I think when this thing was going, uh, Utzon's office maxed out at 15 people. Um, and when I was a recent grad, I remember going to Harry Seidler's office, and Harry Seidler had done a lot of work by then. And his office at that point was 20 people, and that was the biggest they'd ever been. Um, and if I compare that to today's offices now, it's remarkable that how much work those guys put out with a very small crew. And I know certainly from the Seidler office that many people who worked there said it was just a fantastic place to work, even though they worked very hard. 
the output and the commitment to architecture was enormous. So to think of only those low numbers putting out that much work is quite amazing. <coughs> Similarly, in Melbourne, a, a, a similar event occurred where um, we didn't, they didn't sack them, um, but they certainly were under enormous pressure. Um, yeah, that's a very young Don Bates and Peter Davidson, uh, who were the winners of the Under Construction Federation Square, um, which again famously was a competition supported completely by the Premier. Um, I guess it's worth you know us reflecting on this as, as architects, that Jeff Kennett was the Premier at the time. Um, some of you may be old enough to remember that. Um, and he was both the Premier and the Minister for the Arts. Uh, I myself have no time for Jeff Kennett's politics <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, and besides that, he barracks for Hawthorne. So, um, but he he was the premier. The competition was held. Daniel Liberskin was the main judge. He chose a project which many people said was, of course, like his work, uh, which was the lab winning scheme. It happened to be won by two guys, Don Bates and Peter Davidson, who really, Don Bates is a Texan, Peter Davidson's an Aussie, but they were both working uh, and living in London. I think to the best records, they'd completed one project before they won it, uh, which was a bathroom in London uh, as a set of architects. They had no track record whatsoever. Uh, and for me, this is quite important for you to get your head around, and I wish more clients and client bodies would get their head around it. Uh, for architects who are, and I'm interested, of course, in what Diego has to say about this one, but for architects who know that the discipline of architecture is much bigger than simply the scale of the project, your previous experience is not super crucial. Your capacities as a professional are much more important. Um, so these guys, out of basically nowhere, managed to make this thing happen uh, with really no credible previous experience, which is how it is for many, many architects. It's becoming diminished by many, many architects and almost all submissions now requiring you to list previous experience, uh, which is, of course, a catch-22 because if you haven't got the previous experience, how are you supposed to get the job to get the experience to list it as previous on the next one? Okay, But traditionally, that had not been an issue and there have been some remarkable examples, not the least the Opera House, the Pompidou Centre and this one being done by architects who have no previous experience in those building typologies or even buildings at this scale, nothing like it. And yet the building is still one of the great buildings in Melbourne. I disagree with, I don't, it's not my style, but I take my hat off completely to the conviction of the architecture and the capacity of the architecture to engage the public despite the look of it. And I'm completely with Jeff Kennett when he says, uh, we've had the competition, we've chosen the winner, I don't like it, I'm the Minister for the Arts and the Premier, but that's not part of the rules. I'm just telling you my opinion, but that that is not the idea. They've chosen the winner, we're doing it. And then people start bleating about money, blah, 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 Kennett fights them all off and basically says, no, we're doing it. We're just doing it. And that's, that's how it works. And of course, only through that commitment do we end up with the completed Fed Square, which as soon as it opened, even though prior to that, everybody wanted to hate it. I was actually in Perth, living in Perth at the time that it was finished. Um, we did a scheme for it. It was much better than theirs, but we didn't win. But, um, <coughs> but at the end, as soon, almost as soon as it opened, everybody in Melbourne loved it. And it's now become the second biggest tourist draw card in Melbourne, beaten just apparently by the graffiti laneway. So I don't know how people do that kind of data collection. But, uh, but it's a remarkable thing. And uh, the scary and awful thing is that these two guys, Peter Davidson unfortunately had a stroke a few years ago and is no longer working. Uh, but these guys, I think, still have not completed another project in Australia even though they've won half a dozen competitions since then and none of them have been built. All their work has been 
offshore. And I saw Peter Davidson recently, uh, and there's still there's still work that they did in China, which is being completed today. Uh, yet they've not they haven't had another project in Australia, which I think is completely obscene, because they can do it. Yeah. Well, they've got the experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then they list preview experience, Federation Square, and all the value managers go cross them off. I was just saying, no, 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 no,
all comprehension. Um, because Sean Godsall was uh, basically removed from the project of renovating it by the staff at the School of Architecture at RMIT. I'm not hiding from anything here. I've discussed it with them. Uh, where Sean was not really given the chance to give the project a proper go. That he was basically being told what to do. And I think the building is remarkable enough for proof that the architect who did it actually knows what they're doing. Uh, so to be, for it to be suggested that other architects might be able to tell him what to do, um, I think is kind of inadmissible as evidence. Uh, if I use our example upstairs, Kirsten both had a great client, but also a client who was prepared to support her through the project. In this instance, Sean's been excluded, Sean Goltz has been excluded from the project. I believe there are three other architects involved. I haven't seen the subsequent work, but um, Diego informs me it's not very compatible. Um, and these amazing spaces have been now ruined. And I find that difficult to put up with. Um, particularly when the architect is completely available to do that. Have you been to the pub recently? No? <coughs> In the last... Uh, I was there yeah. a few months ago. I got stuck. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been there before, so I don't... It was like this. It was like that. It was like that. It's half, is it? No, that's the other part. So it's got two sides. It's the office yeah. <coughs> this is the bit that was the open multi use space, and then the wide corridors are still as they always are. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, my, my point in this conversation was that we as architects have to be very careful now about how we treat one another uh, because this is not a happy situation, particularly because this, will, this building won the medal in Melbourne not that long ago. So the profession had already said, this is a significant piece of work. And then for the architect who authored it, who was completely available, to be excluded from the situation, I think is not great for architecture. This is my point. I'm not voting for Sean Godsall. I'm just going, I don't think it's a great situation for architecture. Because the subsequent one, I think, is more tricky. Uh, this is... I guess most of you should know, this is short, um, Glenn Merkitt's project at Bundanoon, the Boyd Centre or whatever it's called, um, which was basically the project that Glenn Merkitt won the Pritzker Prize on the back of uh, because it was the first really <coughs> scaled public building that Merkitt had done on top of the incredible repertoire of houses that he'd, that he'd previously finished. Um, so he basically won the Pritzker on this project. The Boyd, well, Arthur Boyd's died. The building complex and site has been entrusted to the national government, as far as I understand. So there's a board who look after it. Uh, the board is populated by many architects. There's a lot of architects on the board. Uh, they therefore wanted to extend it because it's they, they're going to make turn it into a money making, well, at least a they're expanding its um, facilities and its repertoire. So, of course, it seems reasonable that you would just ring Glenn Merkett up, who, yes, is quite old, um, to do the job. And my understanding of it is that Glenn Merkett was rung. Uh, the architects who are on the panel or the board then presented the project to Merkett uh, as this is what we're going to do, this is the site, blah, 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 blah. blah, blah. Um, do you want the commission? And Merkitt, as far as I understand, then said, well, I don't think that's what you should do. I don't think you should build it there. Why don't you treat it like a proper project? <laughs> Employ me as the architect, give me the brief, and I'll make a response to it. Um, my understanding is that Merkitt was then, then described as, quote, getting a little precious. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Uh, and then... Basically, they thought they'd have a limited competition to see who should do the project. 
they asked six architects, they invited six architects, including Sean Godsall, Kirsten Thompson, John Wardle, I don't know who the other three were, uh, to make submissions to it. Um, and Jackson Clements Burroughs were also in there. Um, and John Clements, who's a Deakin alumni and friend of mine, uh, he was initial past president or previous past president of the Institute of Architects. Brian Zalika is on the board of the Boyd Foundation, so he's on the panel. Of the six architects who are invited, only one of them said, no, no, there's only one architect for this job, and his name's Glenn Merkett. There is no reason to give it to anybody else. The one architect who, did, who said that was Sean Godsell. The others all entered, and a very close friend of mine, Kirsten Thompson, won it. And I have said to Kirsten, bad call, Kirsten. Should not have entered. And she said, quite reasonably, no, no, we'll be very respectful. You know, we've asked Glenn if he wants to work on it with us. I just said, it's got nothing to do with respect, Kirsten. <laughs> You're a very fine architect. It's got nothing to do with that. You've now set up a situation where not only have architects canned the original architect, who is more than capable of doing the project, but other architects have now moved into that territory <laughs> and usurped the Pritzker Prize winning, you know, the Nobel Prize in Architecture, most significant Australian architect ever, I would suggest, uh, from doing a job on top of the project that he won the Pritzker for. It's just the wrong message, completely, totally the wrong message. Um, she took my commentary. Um, we're good buddies, but I just, I have to say to you, I think it's in principle completely flawed. Um, and of course, I put it with the Design Hub one in a similar vein, but this one is more significant. I've seen Kirsten's project. It's a fine project. It'll be a great project. She's a good architect. I don't have an issue with that. My issue is where we started, architects not supporting architects, and in doing so, not actually having a comprehension of the dimension of architecture as a discipline and our responsibilities, each and every one of us, to that and our contributions to that and our support within that. That's my issue. So I don't know what Diego yeah, this wants is, to it's, say it's, about it's, it. It's a bit tricky, this one. I mean, I, I see them different, huh? uh, basically because the, uh, well, fundamentally, the uh, first thing is that Kirsten's project is actually pretty good. Huh? Yeah. And, uh, as, it, as it was going to be. Uh, not so the project that we have. Yeah. Uh, that's important. Huh? Uh, secondly, that at least in this one there was a competition, no? which I don't. I'm not sure if Glenn uh, was invited to enter or not. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly, the 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 attitude that's remarkable is Sean Scott's one. Uh, you're saying that I'm not entering that, which is I don't know if you. It, it's pretty hard. I mean, you you get an invite for a competition as attractive as this one as an actor, it's quite tempting. Yeah, you say, okay. First of all, I've been shortlisted, a group of six, all of them very good architects, excellent site next to the kind of a, a remarkable building. To say no to that, I I mean, what Sean did is quite, quite it's impressive thing as, as a, an attitude with the, uh, with the profession. On the other hand, you would say, okay, a, um, if I, I'm gonna be a bit cynic now, I'm gonna put the other side. Uh, uh, what's the radius of the influence of, uh, of, the, uh, of, uh, of a piece of architecture done by a master of those? Huh? So in, in the, Two kilometers around, you can't do anything, or three, four, four. So how many of those projects around you should be done by yourself, offered to you to start with, because you are the one that understood. So it's a bit tricky. So I, I, um, I, I certainly think that the uh, hub attitude, uh, but fundamentally, because they, they actually, I, I think I'm, I'm criticizing it as an attitude, but most than anything, as, as very bad architecture. Right? So it's... What, for me, what's remarkable is how badly those guys have understood a building that, even in Madrid, in Spain, <laughs> a 17,000 kilometers away was public, and all the school of architects we talked about, and we all understood better than apparently the guys that did the refer. <coughs> uh, a, and that's surprising, and that he gets, uh, and it's a smaller project, so he could have done it. This one, um, don't know the story that well, that one, eh? so, don't know. Mm. 
too much of a friend of Kirsten, I think the project's okay, actually. So, so, so I don't know. Mm. Yeah, but you're right, you're right. In the context of this, in, in the context of this lecture, you're right. <laughs> okay. Well, that's also why we're, we're putting it out to you, because you guys are going to become members of the profession soon, which is where this whole well, idea where all, came all about. This, all this comes from that. And, and there's a situation where it can be tricky, so what, what do you do with that? I mean, this one was just in also because Merkit is certainly up for it. I, know I visited this with Diego and a few of you last year, was it? Yeah. Uh, it's an this is the mosque in uh, Newport. It's an incredible project. Incredible project. Uh, by an old man. Um, but the other reason why it was in was also because we heard, uh, many of you would have heard um, Hakana Levely talk about working on this project with Glenn Merkett and his um, incredibly admirable commentary about uh, them going to, I think he said it was the first council meeting where they had to present it. Uh, the mosque in Newport and one of the councillors uh, basically said, if my memory is correct, um, it's fine, we'll tolerate this project because of its nature. And Merkett, amongst all the people there, Merkett the is the only one who stands up and says to the council, no, 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 <laughs> you're not going to tolerate the project. This is not a tolerance issue. You either support the project or you're against it, but you can't tolerated okay um, and many of the members of the public who were there who were probably for and against the project uh, we understand acknowledged the correctness of Merkett's commentary there uh, and he was the only one to say that because uh, Alevely said that to us that it was quite remarkable that Glenn Merkett was the only one who had a big enough political mind to see no no toleration is not is not the issue here so he's not even going to the building. He's just saying, no, no, you can't entertain at a political level such commentary about a cultural event like this to take place. Um, of course, I'm saying to you, Merkett can do that because he sees architecture in a much bigger light than simply the glorification of one of his projects, which is also what Diego and I are kind of trying to intimate tonight. That, as he said in... Uh, 766 last week, you know, architecture is a tradition and a discipline with enormous heritage and responsibility and often we don't, particularly in our days, acknowledge that, which was my reason for conversing about the Sean Goldsell project and the Glenn Merkett one, because now some of that lack of responsibility is working from within and I think that's very problematic. Um, I know that Kim used to work at the Government Architects Office, and I'm not, I'm not sure whether they speak about those things, but I think it's actually quite important. Um, we're doing ourselves a disservice not to do that. Are we going with time? We're fine. We'll it's this. only five past. So only, I mean, in, in this context of this same kind of presentation, we want to talk a little bit about uh, a, um, this conversation of so architects talking uh, uh, about architects. Eh? A, and this is a just three slides of a about the Venice Biennale, which is probably uh, uh, kind of that place where uh, we architects have talked about. Uh, it's it's basically done for us, so we're talking about each other. So um, I had this slide prepared for 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 last uh, masterclass uh, uh, lecture, and it was kind of a. a which I probably you don't know, kind of the what's the history of this Venice Viennale, so what does it mean? Eh? First, of, first of all, I don't know if you know, it's, it's not that old. Eh? So this is, it started in 1980, the, <coughs> the architecture of Venice Viennale, the, the art one is much older, but the architecture was only a part of that eh, uh, during the 20th century. And only in uh, 1980, uh, uh, we could say that architecture was considered significant enough to have its own Viennale, uh, thanks to the effort of Portoghesi, Gregotti, and all this, so that generation over there. So for the first time, a, in the first uh, probably four ones that you see over there, two uh, directed by Portoghesi and two by Rossi, a, very much in a, in a, you want in, a, in an Italian kind of context, so the conversation was about them, uh, and it wasn't such a global event. Uh, uh, but uh, I think it's probably, probably Rossi in, 
in 86, where, uh, where actually he says, no, no, like, this is getting big, and uh, we architects, uh, not only the Italian ones, we should talk to each other, but uh, worldwide. Huh? And he does the first finale, which is about the uh, Belag, yeah, kind of the Dutch, the Dutch uh, architect. So he does his first move towards the internationalization of, of, the, uh, of the Biennale. And from then on, the, the, you know the image what I, what I, that I used in, um, to start the Masterclass, uh, people from Masterclass here, yeah, the Masterclass lecture with the theater over there? That's from this, the progress of Venezia one uh, over there. So after, after that uh, second or uh, fourth Biennale by uh, Rossi, uh, uh, it starts this movement towards the uh, globalization of, of, the, of the conversation amongst artists uh, once every two years uh, in there uh, with different directors. Uh. So Dalco is the first one that actually uh, invites universities over there. Uh, so for the first time, I think the conversation of, of, with architects included universities. So he invites uh, 70 or so uh, different universities across the globe <coughs> to go over there. And, and curiously, that part of the exhibition becomes much more significant than the practice one. Uh, uh, and uh, it's not uh, a surprise that in those late 80s and early 90s, there was not much work in practice out there. And it's where, where the AA, the Bartlett, all the schools uh, uh, of uh, the, the international conversation about that nature was, was happening at universities, uh, which is something that we've talked about quite a few times. The, the kind of the, the different role that uh, uh, academics and academia is playing right now. Uh, much uh, very far away from what seems to be the keeping and that started with the with that one and then Holine was the first uh, non-italian uh, director for the uh, for the um, for the uh, biennale and for those of you that know the italians uh, you know how hard that must have been because they think uh, uh, they are best ones and probably might be they are in many areas but uh, it was pr pretty hard to get somebody not italian to direct that uh, of course, a year after, Fuchs came back and another Italian uh, took over again. And um, uh, with that one, it started what you must have heard of, of the star system. This uh, period that for many, many people has been very uh, negative. And I, I believe that is at the moment where actually uh, critique and conversation in this uh, event start to disappear and uh, to become this fireworks or spectacle of, of the work done by individuals. Eh? Because before, I think certainly the Italian ones, uh, uh, even from the names in Ghetto, Progretto, Venezia, there was a discussion about Venice, uh, the presence of the fire. You see the, uh, even the Islamic countries one, uh, which was, was very surprising that it's done so early then. Uh, I don't know how that would go nowadays. Eh? Uh, so there, there, was a, there was a concern either in an Italian context or a broader one, that architecture was a topic. And uh, it was all about, uh, if you see the program, it's full of events and chats and discussions, and, and it was published, and it was quite intense. After that, after Fuchs, Fuchs once, uh, uh, the, the tone kind of shifted uh, slightly, and it became more, uh, more about uh, self-promotion, I would say. Uh, so I started to kind of say, okay, can I be selected in my country to go to over there? Uh, but, was a tick on your on your CV experience. Maybe you get Fed Square Commission after that. <coughs> a, a, and a, again, an obsession. Uh, we see the title of the of the other ones with the urban phenomena. Huh? So we all became planners and urban guys huh? from architects. So the initial uh, the uh, city took over everything else. Huh? So that was the conversation, and of course that implied inviting many people from outside architecture. So. Uh, so although there were architectural proposals uh, presented at the Venice Biennale, the, uh, the uh, work by sociologists, urban planners, landscapers, all of that became very important in all these different next uh, metamorph cities, architecture and society, uh, until we got to the, uh, if you want, the, the one that produced the, the last shift, I would say, is, uh, is the Betsky one, uh, uh, architecture beyond building, uh, not beyond, beyond, uh, that's a, that's a type of, uh, beyond building, yes. uh, which actually was a, was a biennale where there was not one single building in, the, uh, in the architecture, and, and that was the, it was all virtual, so this moment, that, that was the complete explosion of the, 
of the, uh, if you want, the perimeter of architecture uh, and not the core, uh, kind of a negation of a core on the basis of this uh, uh, discourse that is, uh, it's, it's still happening, that we have to expand our areas of influence. Uh, in this case, by Betsky, uh, in a very controversial finale, uh, nearly negating the core. So there was, there was not to be a conversation among architecture. I think after that, uh, Betsky went probably a bit too far. A, and um, Sejima, uh, the Japanese uh, Carl, uh, went back to this topic of people. Huh? People. More as a title than as a content itself. So, but but it, uh, I think the four, the four last uh, directors of the, of the Biennale have tried to kind of bring the... Uh, Conversation between architects to a point where actually we can understand each other. So, so Shijima first uh, uh, kind of suggested that that uh, kind of common topic was to be people, and then Chipperville kind of expressed on the title. I think something uh, quite important was the common ground. So, what is, what do we share? What do we share? What uh, do in all these people that we can be involved in the urban context and die? Might, we might be whatever. We might be uh, as uh, we might have an expanded discipline if you want, but there must be something that we share, all of us, to be called architects, all of us. Yeah? So uh, Chipperfield proposed that as a topic for uh, for his biennale in 2012. Uh, a, but Chipperfield, uh, I don't know if you've read him or heard him, he, he's, a, uh, he didn't, the biennale works, the director kind of sets a topic and normally is in charge of one or two pavilions, the central pavilions, and then he tells the national pavilions to follow the, the instructions. Yeah? So everybody in principle has to follow that kind of in the selection of projects, <coughs> or whatever. Uh, so that kind of drives the conversation in a certain direction. Uh, Chipperfield wasn't that good at, at controlling the national pavilion, so every pavilion went over there with their own thing. So, so there was not much definition of, of a common ground. Uh, and it had to be uh, Rem Kulhas, which is... Uh, not much of a democrat, but a dictator, if you want. So he said, okay, we haven't found the common ground, now we're going to say fundamentals, this is going to be my thing. So it was actually saying the same. What are the fundamental things about architecture that we can do? Uh, and that is the topic. Yeah? Uh, and he said that, I think, uh, more strictly than ever in the, in the Biennale. So I said, we want to uh, find out uh, what are the tools that we architects work with, because we've, we've kind of gone to too far away out, out there, so we want to find out. Huh? And uh, based on one of his, uh, so he was in charge of, he, he designed kind of a research thing, and he arrived to the fundamentals, which uh, uh, he identified as certain elements that compose architecture, huh, if you want. So, uh, so the, and they have, have done so uh, forever. So floor, wall, ceiling, door, all these minimal particles that compose the response that any architecture in the world and in from any uh, period uh, with any inclination that uh, actually works with to do stuff. Huh? Uh, and, and that's why we can talk to each other. What he's saying over there is that's why we can talk to each other uh, uh, and how we can uh, evolve if you want. So the exhibition was done like this. Uh, and this, you see, an image, that's an image from the a, a window uh, uh, display, if you want. And the other one underneath is one from the ceiling with all the services and stuff right? so there were little kind of areas and so uh, so after after um, uh, uh, Kulhas had defined that uh, the terms of uh, the those uh, uh, elemental particles of architecture has come uh, Aravena uh, last year uh, uh, with a, a another proposal which reporting from the front I don't know how much you've heard about that one but that's uh, I read it in, in the way that say, okay, now that uh, a, we have clarified in the, in the last Biennale what are the tools we have, let's see in what areas, in what spaces in the world actually architecture can make a positive contribution. Right? Uh, and that's what he calls the front. And the front, for our vein at least, is not our Western kind of uh, st stable kind of uh, cities, if you want, uh, and pretty wealthy and with not much trouble, but in those normally third or second world, uh, world uh, countries where uh, there is a very extreme context uh, that actually is requiring the intervention of architecture. So he's collected all this uh, 
initiatives, uh, most of them kind of uh, not of a large scale uh, and very uh, not many of them not done by star architects at all, important architects, but where, where architecture has gone over there with those fundamentals uh, uh, to kind of produce uh, what he says, uh, a, a uh, improved way of life where people live over there. So in a sense, I, I see those these two final ones uh, very related in terms of situating where the conversation is right now uh, for architecture. Uh, so what, uh, what uh, we think of ourselves, uh, that's expressed in the Venice Biennale pretty well, a, a, uh, on the one hand in 2014, uh, I think uh, Kuh has made a big effort to kind of define what tools we had uh, to uh, do our job for society and for the visitor if you want. Uh, and went through a, a historic and, and and also a creative kind of analysis of the tools we had uh, going through all these elements. And Aravena has pointed out uh, quite uh, a dramatic situations even uh, in, in certain parts of the globe <coughs> where actually the impact of the intervention of the Arctic is extremely significant. Huh? It can be argued and discussed if uh, this, uh, at least from my point of view, that... Uh, if uh, implicit in, in the proposition from Aravena is not that, uh, for instance, in Geelong out here, we don't have anything to do. Huh? It's kind of, I don't know if he means it's a lost battle already, so we can't do anything, we can't contribute to anything out there, it's already done. Or, and he's asking all the architecture to go to these places where it's required. Uh, a, I would add, accepting that we've lost that battle, uh, and I would disagree with that one. Uh, I, I think we do have to contribute to. Uh, non-extreme context, uh, where kind of uh, extreme necessities are, are, are asking for stuff, but uh, there is a kind of a large portion of the architectural community now worldwide that is actually saying that, that uh, because of the results we're getting day after day up there, in practice, uh, you know, you get Gary saying 95% or 98% of the architecture that's done out there is rubbish, uh, and that type of statement. Uh, I don't know if his work is in there or not. Huh? That's really something that's just, but that's what he says anyway. So I see those these two kind of uh, uh, biennales as, uh, and I actually see the to to look at these uh, how the biennales evolve and have evolved in the last uh, thirty years and the titles and the topics. I think it's a very uh, good indicator of of. Uh, or where the discipline is going, yeah, and what's concerning us, yeah? and how it's evolving from one situation from the local to the global, then to the urban, uh, then a bit of a mess, then to the digital world, if you want, with uh, Betsky. So, this fascination with other technologies other than architecture, and then suddenly going back, okay, no, no, it's not, let's, let's not go that digital, let's go back to people who actually, we, it's a space that we inhabit. And then somebody reflecting, okay, but what do we do to do well? Huh? Uh, what tools do we have huh, to do this stuff? Huh? And now, finally, uh, uh, Aravena can kind of just pointing out a direction. I would, I personally don't agree that much with Aravena, although the projects over there are excellent, uh, exhibit over there, uh, and some of the pavilions were very good. But uh, that's the that's the situation, guys. That's the I mean, and that's what I wanted to wanted to bring this up today, uh, just to show you. I mean, this is the world you're going to be entering and for the one you, you'll have to find a position yourself huh? and and an, even an attitude how you talk to your colleagues and about your colleagues huh? it's in this very I would say very intense and dynamic world that we are facing and it's it's extremely uh, I think there's, there's a job to do there's a work to do because uh, nobody actually knows very well what we're doing yeah? so so uh, and it's it we are I don't like the word reinventing but I we're not reinventing ourselves. We've been inventors a long time ago. Uh, we're just working out uh, what is the most valuable contribution that we can do with our skills. And there must be something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, you want to? do we have last, last? Or? Oh. Are we going to do the... No, we don't know. I think you're going to do that. Oh, are we going to do that? Yeah? Can we do this? Indecision doesn't look good off the tongue. <sighs> it's too long, this. Too long, okay. It's too long. And many of these guys have seen this. Huh? Have you seen this? You remember this? Guys, I did 763 with uh, last trimester. He was part of the opening lecture. So one of the attempts that somebody has done, uh, some uh, 
a bit younger, in between your generation and our generation. I mean, I was saying, when I was saying that this, uh, we are, everybody's a bit confused in the world of architecture right now, even talking. Uh, and that is kind of, uh, if you want uh, evidence uh, in the lack of analysis that the discipline has had in the last uh, 30, 40 years. Eh? No, nearly before the 1970s, there were lots of different maps, uh, people, historians, theorists, academics, kind of mapping what was going on no? uh, in the world, in, in the world of architecture. Uh, and there's lots of theories, and, and we listed a few of them that we might uh, during the 20th century. Then, for a for a period that we can consider a critic uh, since the 80s to probably the year 2000, the the speed of the changes and the uh, speed of production was so large that actually nobody uh, even attempted to do a classification at a or a categorization of any type of the of the work that Artich was doing. Uh, only recently, uh, this guy, uh, Alejandro Faera, you might know him, it's from Foreign Office of Architects, FOA, I think I'm sure Burak knows him now. Uh, um, he attempted a, a political compass of emergent practices right in the world right now. Huh? So what he uh, has identified, uh, that's his point, and that there has been an increase on the political kind of uh, uh, positions of Arctics in the last uh, decade, as opposed to what had happened in the previous three or four. So the, the political statements amongst Arctic was something very strong, uh, very common, I would even say required, in the, uh, uh, before the 1980s or so. So every architect you could talk about uh, in every project they did, you could actually see a political statement embedded in there uh, of some type. Huh? And so politics and architecture was, were, were actually uh, very much related. Huh? After that, uh, in what uh, many people have called liberalism or capitalism, uh, a, there was a moment of silence of all this political kind of uh, awareness, concerns, or messages in that day. What uh, Thayera says that in the younger generation, in this emergent practices, he is starting to detect in very different manners an increase of this political kind of uh, uh, impulse, if you if you want to, eh? in very different manners and expressed in very different ways, eh? depending on the. Uh, and he's proposed this map that you see up here with different uh, uh, practices around the world, and he's grouped them in uh, different sort of political attitudes. Uh, um, I've got uh, many of them you might know, some of them know. So what I did in 763, I went through many of these ones, uh, explaining what they were, uh, what they were, but I don't think I have time for that. Do we have time? No, we don't have time for that. No? So we go to, so these were the ones, uh, so we got some, I like the names, uh, in his classification, sometimes he's a bit, uh, he's a bit cheeky, you know them. You get some of these guys that you might know in there. Oh, that's, that was me putting them in those categories. Yeah, so it's fine. Skeptics, you get there. Huh? So you know some of the guys, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You know this guy too? Yeah, yeah, yeah you do. So that was that was a kind of the uh, slide that I used to uh, for you guys, and I think it's pertinent right now still. Uh, you have to situate yourself here. All the, certainly if you are in master class, but even if you're not in master class yet, you've got to start seeing you somewhere here. I'm not saying the diagram is correct and it covers everything, but uh, uh, I think you have to situate yourself. Sir. And that only happens through conversations with other architects. Sir. And we just wanted to finish this one with... This is the Teatro del Mondo again. That Im another image from that uh, uh, 1980... Uh, uh, Biennale, uh, a, a, directed by Rossi, and he, his, what, this was his proposal, it was the theatre of the world, huh? and in this, it was a floating structure huh? in the middle of the lagoon, hmm? and I just, uh, I, I used this one in, together with the, when I uh, talk about the Biennale, it was in this one, if uh, Kuch has in a sense, uh, uh, this kind of a poetic image, 
Kuchen has uh, indicated what are the what's the ammunition no, or, of the uh, of architecture really. So it's it's actually uh, made an effort to kind of define exactly what what do we have to go out there to war using the Alejandro of uh, Aravena's kind of language of reporting from the front. Uh, so Aravena's actually, in from his point of view, indicated what are the front, uh, what are, what are the areas where we have to make a contribution. I like to see now retrospectively this image from uh, from Rossi as the this theatre. Uh, a dot here in near land, kind of putting all this ammunition inside this piece of art floating architecture, uh, charging itself with all the architectural ammunition that it might need, ready to be kind of sent uh, to these uh, battles overseas or to any fronts that Arena might indicate. Um, and I, don't know, I just find it a kind of a curious image, yeah? and it sort of is very powerful uh, with the floating and the real thing. And um, yeah. Anything else? No, I don't think so. I'm interested in... Well, it, it was very... I mean, the, our idea was to go through this one uh, for you guys and open this to the floor to see where they are uh, intentionally controversial, I think. Uh, so, say if you agree, <coughs> don't disagree, where you situate yourselves, where you... Si I mean, that that's the... The point of this lecture today is actually... It, it was supposed to be much more conversational. It has been, actually. There's not been any conversation at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tess has talked for a while. I have to... That's a conversation. They haven't even talked to each other. It is well, we've already done that. It is, okay, that's not I took notes. Probably true. To that. Probably true. Probably true. Yeah. Anyway, we hope it was kind of. We think it's an important conversation. We got more notes here, but um, I, for me, um, the comment that came out of uh, both Chipperfields but then Aravanas, you know, are we? Is it meaningless for us to operate? normally anymore is, is it really only architectural battles out on the kind of social wastelands or political wastelands uh, I think we both disagreed with that um, that you know you have you have to architecture is wherever you decide you're up for it really um, and because Aravena even himself is his major projects are certainly not at the sort of battlefront that the socio-politically Difficult, that's for sure. So, but anyway, we, we thought it was a conversation that might be worth at least putting on the table for the for the real. Um, and certainly for me, Diego and I have had lots of conversations about architects helping, displacing, being discordant towards other architects. Uh, and I don't think we I don't think we're doing ourselves a lot of service at the moment. Um, and I am certainly concerned when many of you go out to practice. That if people don't have this political clout or this commitment to architecture as a bigger thing, bigger than any practice, uh, then we're kind of lost. And to some degree, that's where Aravena can say, well, it's meaningless to operate in this um, conflicted field of current practice where you just, you, most people are scrabbling to cut fees and try to get another project rather than add to the big club, as Ian McDougall once called it. But anyway, well, we hope you enjoyed it. So we're interested in conversation if anybody's still up for it. So one thing that I thought about the other day, when, uh, this morning when I was putting up the photo of those four characters, <coughs> we've got this recording. Three of, characters plus a ring. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm going to make a comment that you're going to like. Uh, <laughs> a, is that, of course, you, you get recordings from Corb talking very positively or negatively yeah. about the other two, uh, and, and from Wright talking basically negatively about the rest, but some, some positive ones. And uh, and me is of course. It's very curious how little Rem Cook has has written a lot about architecture. How little he said about other others' works. Uh, very very little in his. So he speaks about the situation of architecture, uh, and he I think he does very very deep and sharp analysis of of, of everything that's going on uh, in our world. He hardly ever says anything about anybody else's work. Anybody, there's kind of a fear right now, and I think that's kind of a common thing. Eh? Uh, so even Gary, when I was making that comment, he says, "98 of the architecture out there is uh, is rubbish." Okay, please, Frank, could you tell us what, uh, which one? Did you, I mean, which is something I think some years ago actually you went up to another. <coughs> I remember in, in Spain just my my conversations with my, with my family saying. 
and then telling each other uh, uh, it was not good. I, I was in it. I was I was very young. Was I was in a dinner in Rome <coughs> with Fabi and uh, Bruno Fabi, the critic, yeah, you know, him and and a couple of Italian artists, yeah? uh, very famous one, uh, very famous one, yeah? Giulio La Fuente, and one of them had just done the the uh, underground. No, it was the train line or something from the airport to Rome. Huh? From uh, actually a good piece of kind of sort of futuristic thing. Huh? Mm -hmm. And in that dinner, that guy he was there sitting there. I don't know what I was doing there, but he was sitting there. He told Sebi, "Okay, hey, what do you think of my latest thing?" And his response was, "I, I, I yo no parlo de porqueria." Huh? I don't know how many of you speak Italian. <laughs> Like that. I mean, I mean, we hadn't even started with the bloody gnocchi. Either, so I was saying, what's going on? What's going to happen? You're not bad with I don't speak about rubbish. Yeah? And that was the response of it. Uh, uh, done. Eh? You know, are we, are we going to kill each other? So that intensity, and, and this very clearly saying what you thought, in this case it was negative, but uh, I, I heard some very positive ones. Also. So even praising somebody else's work eh? uh, strongly, eh? strongly, when you actually. Well, this attitude is that Sarina and select that work, or, or Prouvé selecting the thing for the form. So making a strong praise of, of, of a bit of work done by somebody else, yeah. uh, and not being not having trouble saying that. Yeah, it's an excellent bit of work. And I, I think I can, against all criteria, I can say that this is the right scheme to do, and I've got to find it. I mean, that, that's even that clarity in the judgment of how the work goes. I don't know for what reason, it's starting to be lost. And we have to go, and that's my critic to Aravena, to those kind of yeah. uh, other scenarios where obviously there's nothing uh, and produce a tiny thing to think that we are valuable, uh, to kind of confirm uh, our value in, uh, in the world right now, that we're doing something useful and we shouldn't be all sacked. We have to go to those very extreme situations where actually there's nothing, so there's nothing to compare to. And we're not actually kind of trying to make up our minds what's going on there. So just saying... Telling each other when somebody does a very brilliant piece of work, just say very clearly. If somebody does a shit piece of work in the design hub, just put a say very clearly. And then we'll stop. I don't know. That was a comment. <laughs> you can disagree. You can disagree.